Welcome to the Global Goodness webinar. The oceans are rising and so are we. This was the text on a homemade sign by a protester in the Glasgow Climate Summit. A 10 year old child carried a sign saying, climate is changing, why aren't we? Another 10 year old protester expressed his beliefs. I think we can save the planet, but we have to act now. I'm a little older, but I hold the same belief. My name is Mayrita Ollila, and I work as professor of practice at Turku School of Economics in the field of global business ethics. Our topic today is how to implement global change. And I have the great pleasure and honor to introduce our distinguished speakers. Uh, Doctor of Philosophy, uh, Elena Melgin, is CEO of PROCOM, the Finnish Association of Communications Professionals, since 2005. She's also docent in history of political communication at Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of Turku. Melgin is a founding member of VEN, Communication Ethics Council in Finland. Elina, you're warmly welcome. Professor Paula Salo comes from the Department of Psychology and Speech and Language Pathology, University of Turku. She's currently leading a large research consortium funded by the Strategic Research Council. The main aims of the consortium include using behavioral sciences for steering communities to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in commuting and optimize carbon storage in the forest. Uh, Salo has long experience in teaching and research, including epidemiological and experimental research in psychology, psychosocial factors, and public health. She has also been active in the national network of psychology departments in Finland, Sykonet, and acted as its longest standing leader. Great to have you with us. Professor Audi Korhonen is Master of Science, Master of Laws, Licentiate of Philosophy, and the Doctor of Juridical Science from Harvard Law School. Her main area of expertise is international law. Korhonen has worked in academia and in government. She serves as core faculty in the Institute of Global Law and Policy in Harvard Law School and as a member on a number of editorial boards of academic journals and yearbooks. Her current research projects include international law and technology from a critical theory perspective, governance of blockchain society and other emerging technologies. Thank you for being here. Thank you. So let us warm up with a question that I would like to ask all of you. What has been the most significant stimulus or stimuli, if you like, that inspired you to think about sustainability? Was there something that awakened you to the challenges and promoted change in your lives? Uh, Elina, would you like to begin? Thank you, Majorita. Your very uh, tough questions, uh, hard to answer. I don't have just one single uh, stimuli. They have begun long ago. I'm uh, quite old and I've experienced hard and snowy winters. And suddenly I live in the middle of the rainy season uh, during the whole year. And also when I'm seeing daily news, I see catastrophes that are quite near me. In Norway, when mountains are melting and heavy rains are followed by the floods, houses collapse to mud. But uh, on the other hand, I'm a historian. I've, I've studied uh, history of culture, history of art. So I'm very worried about the situation where I hear from the news and I see uh, catastrophes relating to religion, uh, religion conflicts, global contradictions, and politics, power, and nationalism. So I moan deeply by the situation, for example, how Syria cultural heritage is being destroyed because of the complicated war. Well, what I've done uh, after having seen and, and heard and, and experienced all this is 
I've been talking about uh, ethical communication responsibility for, for 16 years I've been heading PROCOM. And I have a strong belief that communications people could take a stronger role in all that is relating to negotiation and diplomatic work in the world so that we can do something for the, for the sustainable issues in, the, in this global earth. Thank you. Soon we'll hear more about your way of tackling the challenges. What about Paul? Well, for me, either there has not been any single specific or dramatic thing that has awakened me or inspired me to think about sustainability or, or to carry out research regarding uh, climate change. I think it has been in my thoughts more or less for, from the something like the 1990s when I was still in school, in, in high school. And so at that time, Michael Jackson's Earth Song music video was quite impressive for, for a high school student. But after that, of course, what Elena summarized all the things that have been happening in the world. There is no one specific thing for me. You were in the school when I was a grown-up and had a discussion with Bentley Linkola on his new books book, uh, 1989, Introduction to the Thought of the 1990s. And some people were at school. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. What about Odi? Well, it's uh, very hard to pinpoint a uh, single incident because I grew up in the 70s, which was the time of the Green Awakening all around the world. And there was the first oil crisis in 1973 and so on. But one thing that had a sort of a um, Robin Hood-like quality in a young child of 10 in 1979, I think, was the Koyarvi incident when Irina Kroon, Ville Komsi and other legends of the Green Movement in Finland chained themselves to the trees in front of the bulldozers that had come to train the lake. And maybe the fact that they were not successful made uh, a child sympathize with them even more and, and start to kind of think and listen to that sort of green politics and, and, and all of those sustainability ideas with a, with a more keen ear than I otherwise would have. Yes, that was a very remarkable moment in Finnish history. It was, and my parents took me there, so I saw it firsthand. Mm -hmm. Great from them. But uh, let's dive deeper into our topics today. Uh, Elena, as the CEO of Procom, you know the field of communications extensively. What kind of opportunities do communication professionals have to promote sustainable development? You already started on that topic, but now we'll hear more. Mm. Thank you for asking. Well, this is, this is something I've been <laughs> doing quite many years already, like raising the opportunities for communications people to tackle the issue. So I see many, many different roles. First role is strategic role. So if a company or an organization takes a communication seriously as part of the strategy making in the board level, then there are possibilities to, um, to utilize um, uh, sustainability part of the brand. If not, then there might be a situation where they have to kind of a name uh, or you use the name greenwashing in their in the communication. So that they're, they're not magicians. They cannot invent a responsible purpose for the organization. It must be there. Um, and it's their role then to, to integrate sustainable uh, messages to communications for different target groups like employee communication, shareholder, in, uh, shareholders, investor relations, citizen communication, stakeholders like partners, uh, to compile the holistic story, to share it, and to believe all to the same story. 
um, and in best companies, actually, uh, managing director and and communications department work very closely. On the other hand, we have a, a new role for communications people because everybody is communicating and the department of communication is, is, is helping, coaching. So this coaching role, uh, what means uh, for the coaching role for communications people is that they understand what sustainability issues are. It's not so evident. They have to be sort of generalists in sustainability. They have to offer content, uh, in a new context these days. Then there is a role of activist, which is quite hard because uh, we believe in communications uh, field that everything must be done anyway, according to laws and regulations. So the real sustainable responsible work starts only after everything is done already well, like correctly. And there uh, the company can kind of show the real uh, responsibility in the society or in a global level or whatever they choose to. We call it corporate activism and communications people are driving this activism. They are, they are leading activist role. It includes high risks like we know, for example, the case of, of Finlayson, but I'm not uh, telling it now so that I probably would steal all your time here again and tell later. Um, and then we have this uh, role of a maintaining, building and maintaining a trust. Actually, uh, the first main task for communications people nowadays in Nordic countries is to build and maintain trust. How can you do that if you don't build everything on sustainable and responsible platform? All the messages, everything that you, you work for. Um, Yes, so um, this is also social responsibility or sustainability and responsibility are also concepts that we should kind of clarify a little bit. We talk about actually more uh, responsibility than sustainability in the communications field. Great ideas like this corporate activism. <laughs> Sounds wonderful. And also your rhetoric is very persuasive because now all of us have to stay to the discussion after the break. We'll have to find out what this Finlayson case is all about. Yes. <laughs> but, but let's go further. Can you give us some examples of successful communication that has actually changed people's behavior? Well, uh, if we don't talk, talk about the Finlayson case now, because it's more like like. Uh, Let's yeah. talk about the Finlayson case. Yes. Okay, I tell that first, but then I have more kind of a powerful examples. Um, this fin Finlayson case is uh, they have their marketing and communications uh, done in a different way than normally in Finnish society. So they have uh, tried to with their tricks. We call it like they can be tricks as well. So they have used advertising to raise issue, for example, that people, uh, women are not paid equally. If you don't kind of provo make provocative way, then people are not looking at, at what, what should be done. So there are evils that we have to kind of uh, change in the society. But what have happened that they have been um, sanctioned by offering products for women with lower price. On the other hand, they have, um, the, done uh, other things like, for example, promoting Tom of Finland sheets, like you know, uh, and that has caused to a situation where the managing director have been targeted ag attacks, even death threats. So this is the way that corporate activism is uh, currently seen and known in Finland. But when, if you talk like globally, how we can with communications change things. Um, Actually, nothing happens without communication. If an organization has the most powerful, most beautiful, ethical, responsible strategy, it doesn't move anywhere from the heads of the, those who created it without communication. With communication, I think the clearest and, and the best example is Me Too movement. People have suddenly started to talk about uh, bad behavior, even harassment. And it's not acceptable anymore, like it was still 10 years ago. 
I think it's because of the transparent and open communication. Pe people have are brave to tell what have happened to them. They're mostly women, but anyway. Uh, but also small things like this climate is affecting people. We think about should we not eat any more meat? Uh, can I still use my car with gasoline? Gasoline um, is it already so not not, not good thing? Uh, and it's uh, like it's twenty years ago we had the same with the tobacco. If you remember, um, well, I have an anecdote here. I, when I was a young communications professional, I had an honor to, to be a local PR person for great movie film director, Christoph Kieslowski, who visited Finland. In a, it was very hard at winter time. And he said that it's humiliating to go out, outside to smoke a cigarette in Finland. It was not yet uh, uh, in the in Eastern country that you had to go outside to smoke, but it was already those days in Finland. And nobody smokes at, uh, in, inside anymore. It's, it's because of the communication, but it's also due to regulation laws that well, which one comes first, it depends. And then what, what else? Uh, now it's coming Christmas time. We say for, for, for children that if you're not behaving well, then the Christmas elves are listening and you'd get less presents. It's communication, isn't it? And then we have all sort of uh, uh, smart companies making campaigns like we, we had a couple of years ago, Neste making a campaign of, of um, ham trick. Uh, if, if you are baking ham, uh, you cannot uh, pour the, the, um, the fat to the tubes because it's dangerous. So they organized uh, different kind of recycling uh, spots for for families to to put their waste there, and I think that since then people have understood that you cannot you cannot do that anymore. That you 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 pour your your fat to to tubes. So these kind of examples, but there are so plenty of many other. I yeah. Thank you. Great examples. Next, I would like you to do some of my work for me, <laughs> because I work in in. Uh, global ethics and now I would like to know is there a global communication or media ethic? Um, do you want me to continue? Yes. Yes. Well, this is the hardest. This is really a hard one. We do have code of ethics in every country, I believe, uh, at least uh, in Nordics and in, in most of the European countries. Um, and then we have the, the, the association like program compiling those code of ethics and also the council of ethics that we have in Finland, not in every country. And then we, ha then we have associations of associations. Uh, in the communications field, we, it's called like Global Alliance for Public Relations and Communication Management. And we do have in a global level communications ethics, as we have also for journalists. But I'm talking about communications now. Uh, it's perhaps less known, known that we have a fairly similar kind of codes that we have in, in journalism. According to research, um, people don't know them very well, even they work in the field of communications, they rely on their own personal ethical codes. And, and then we have the problem that in, couch, in, in each country we have different kind of laws and regulations. So if something is happening, how to, to punish uh, who is judging uh, if something is done wrong. We have different kind of values and moral uh, issues in Nordic countries uh, than, for example, in Turkey or Russia. Uh, it's, it's just a view that we see things like what's the purpose of the communications. It used to be some, from the same roots, propaganda. But today we do everything to be opposite of propaganda. But it might be something else in, in different countries. So um, in theoretical level, we have global ethics. In reality, it's harder to tackle. I think that we should have um, supranational uh, organizations like um, United Nations. Most of the coding in media and, and communications are based on the 
on a charter of United Nations. In that perspective, we have some kind of a platform. Is the organization weakening or strengthening? I think we should do something that it's, it's stronger. Uh, we shouldn't rely on states. States have, they fight each other, with each other. We have information influencing, spray, spreading all over. And it's because of the uh, big countries like Soviet and China and, and United States. We should have other organizations fighting for that uh, development. For example, strengthening supranational organizations like United Nations, EU is this, uh, another possibility, or big uh, international corporations that have a lot of money and power to do something. Thank you. You covered very well the issues that there exist all over in different uh, fields when we talk about global ethics. The situation is pretty much the same, but uh, the important thing is that there is a lively discussion going on. Maybe we'll move further. Thank you, Elina. Uh, next, I would like to hear Paula. Your current research project deals with nudging and climate change. Could you please tell us about the nudge methodolo methodology? Yeah. Um, the main idea of nudging is to use behavioral knowledge and insight to steer people's decision making. Um, the theory, the nudge theory, has been proposed by Richard Taylor and Cass Sunstein. And according to the original definition of a nudge, uh, a nudge is any aspect of the choice architecture that alters people's behavior in a predictable way. Uh, without forbidding any options or without significantly changing economic uh, incentives. And the nudges must be easy and cheap to avoid. So we are sort of, we are constantly surrounded by choice architecture. And by choice architecture, I mean the way different choices are presented to us. For example, uh, the choice architecture can be practically anything. It can be physical, it can be digital, social. And for example, in this, this Zoom program, there are, it has been designed in some way where all the elements are, how, how everything is presented. So the choice architecture is there. And in nudging, the choice architecture is sort of consciously changed based on understanding how people behave and what drives uh, their decision making. Especially in many everyday situations, people tend to rely on this fast, um, automatic and unconscious way of processing information and making decisions. And this is because people are sort of built to save or optimize their cognitive resources. And nudging uh, uses, or someone might even say, takes advantage of uh, different mental heuristics and biases and even cognitive errors that are typical for this kind of fast information processing. And nudging can take different forms. For example, in many situations, it is possible and even necessary to define a default option. Um, the sort of uh, decision that is easiest to make what is offered to the decision maker. For example, in if an um, energy company that makes fixed term contracts with their clients, um, if they um, offer the next contract uh, to the client, uh, they offer some specific type of, of contract. They don't say that you can select from, from this large selection, but they, they offer you some specific contract. And in many cases, people are likely to stick to the default option. And therefore, for example, use of sustainable energy could be increased if the energy companies offer a contract with sustainable energy source as a default. 
but um, much can also be a change in, in, for example, the physical environment, or it can be a way in which information is presented to people. For example, what Elena was talking about, it may include social comparison and things like that. Very interesting. When Salstein's and Taylor's book first appeared, I was quite struck by the idea that our context gives us subconscious cues that actually uh, affect our choices and, and how these default options uh, are tremendously important. The first thing I understood was that we still kept having Donald Duck magazine in our household 18 years after the day when the last person stopped reading it because somebody had sold it and then it would have taken a lot of trouble to get rid of this subscription <laughs> and and then i began to see this subconscious cues and default options everywhere but as you said they can be consciously used uh, we can take hold of this process and in that context, how can nudging be applied, for example, in the fight against climate change? Yeah, um, nudging could be used to encourage behavior that helps people to mitigate climate change by making that kind of behavior and decision making easier. Um, nudging can also help to bridge the so-called uh, value action gap, or when it comes to climate change, people talk about the green gap, which means that many people would actually be interested, be interested in and motivated to behave in a sustainable way, but for one reason or another, they are unable to. Well, it can be that they don't have enough knowledge or they they don't have some equipment for it or it can be related to the choice architecture in, in many ways one example could be like uh, recycling if the instructions are very complex on which materials go into which box so people may make unintentional errors in recycling or they just Fed up, get fed up and, and just give up trying if it, if it takes too much effort to recycle. Um, in practice, there are many areas in climate change mitigation where nudging could be applied. And for example, in, in our research project with Climate Nudge, we aim to nudge people to choose more sustainable traffic modes when they are commuting to work or school. And, and we are trying to steer private forest owners to make sustainable decisions regarding their forests, because the forests are an important carbon storage in, in Finland. So it balances out the, the, um, the ga greenhouse gas emissions. And you know, it's about, 60% uh, of the Finnish forests are actually owned by private citizens, so it's quite an important place to work. From the very beginning, the method has been criticized on ethical basis. Sunstein and Taylor called their, uh, their approach soft paternalism, and that is so wrong. There should not be anybody paternalizing us, we are autonomous, we all know better. And, and there were many other issues. And in your research project, you've dealt with ethical issues as well. Uh, what kind of ethical problems have you detected? And, and how would you assess these challenges? Yeah, well, I think the term that is nowadays being used is libertarian paternalism which refers to uh, the paternalism part refers to someone knowing better what is good for you, how, how you should behave. And libertarian means in this context that um, even though people uh, with nudging people are 
steered to behave in a certain way, um, their freedom is retained so that they can choose some other way of, of behaving without um, getting any any sanctions or any it doesn't um, it's there is no significant cost for choosing some other option. But here yeah, steering people's behavior it's um, always raises ethical questions and there are a lot of ethical questions regarding nudging. And some of the ethical questions uh, regard all nudges, regardless of whether they target climate change or people's health behavior or some other aspects. And this, um, this is one, one example that regards all nudges, whether, whether the nudges really retain the freedom and autonomy of the people who are being matched, even though they are meant to. But um, other ethical questions are more relevant to climate nudges. And by climate nudges, I, I mean nudges that aim to encourage behavior that helps to mitigate climate change and are motivated by, by climate concerns. So um, we are here today to discuss global change so maybe I should raise particularly questions regarding global justice of nudging. Um, and one of the first um, aspects is that related to the paternalism perhaps, but um, nudges are usually used to help an individual to make a better decision for him or her. For example, in <clears throat> in promoting healthy behaviors. But in the climate change uh, context, when it comes to climate matches, uh, the aim is to benefit all people in the long run. And these climate matches may not produce any immediate benefits for, for an indi individual. On the other, on, on the contrary, they may even uh, induce costs instead of benefits for the individual even though globally they are producing some, some benefits for other people. And um, another um, ethic, important ethical issue is that uh, if we think that it is ethically uh, required that we use all possible methods to mitigate climate change, and that in, includes nudging in the global context. So in that case, we need to think which governments or institutions have the strongest moral duty to implement these, these kind of uh, interventions. And because they, there are always some costs arising, so we have to think who should pay the cost. Should we follow the sort of polluter pays principle or the ability to pay principle or some other principle. And one more central uh, question regarding global justice is that, <clears throat> uh, as you said before, that this, this is sort of soft uh, method. So are climate nudges sufficient for tackling such a vicious problem as climate change? In, in many other contexts, the effects of nudging have been rather modest and fading in, in time. So the questions are like, should we use resources for such a soft method like nudging? Does it take resources away from more efficient or more or better solutions for climate change mitigation? But on the other hand, nudges could possibly be combined with um, more efficient, although probably less appealing methods such as legislation or, or some restrictions. So if we combine these methods, can we make them more efficient? And after all, it, it should be said to say that, that no climate policy should rely only on nudging. But these are important questions and they they may in part affect how well the nudges work 
and these and, and many, many other considerations have to be taken into account when, when the energies are being planned. And after all, well-designed and really clever energies can also promote justice, I think. Thank you. I must say that I've not been very worried about ethics in the nudging context ever. For example, on the individual level uh, about freedom, there is the freedom to choose otherwise. We simply make the beneficial uh, activities more easy and easily accessible. And on the collective level, we can agree, we can open a democratic discussion whether we want to reach a particular goal and what kind of nudges we might want to establish. The weird part is that they still work, even if we are aware of their existence. So I, I see great possibilities here. Thank you very much. Thanks. Now, if uh, communications and, and nudge uh, are not uh, everything we need, we tend to turn to law, after all. Uh, that must work. <laughs> we know that ethics is an informal system for regulating behavior. And legislation, on the other hand, is a formal regulation system. And now, Odi, how do you see legislation's potential to bring about sustainable change at the national and EU level? Well, um, uh, speaking as the representative of regulation, I, I have to enter the caveat that uh, for at least 100 years, globally speaking, and especially in the EU, we regulators have understood that we are going to be considered extremely outdated carmudgeons if we cannot produce flexible regulation and also soft law and, and so come closer to informal norms uh, as well as rigorous, rigorous hard law. But to answer your question about formal norms or formal laws and their usefulness in bringing about sustainable chains, ethical business models, accountable supply chains or regenerative economy in general, uh, legal rules are, of course, incredibly important. Uh, formal law is a tool like a hammer, and in the right hands with the right skills, you can build any kind of structures with it. And, and law sets these formal structures for social behavior and for social interaction. And, and it is as much part of the problems that we have today as it can be part of, of the solutions. So um, law itself is not different from any other governance technology. It is how we use it. Uh, so I think it has every possibility as well as uh, to go right as to go wrong. I guess we Finns are very law abiding. We respect the law and we, we want it to solve problems and, and not take responsibility for using it so much. So, so that's a really demanding thing you're talking about. But uh, further on, what kind of international legal institutions uh, could contribute to the realization of sustainable development in the world? International law is your field. Uh, well, um, of course, law itself is also an institution, but on the level of concrete institutions, I think uh, Paula and, uh, and Elena also already mentioned United Nations and uh, similar international organizations, um, one could raise uh, the role, the very prominent role of the environmental program, the UNEP, uh, or the EU's environmental um, score, which is impressive, uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization, etc. Uh, and on this intergovernmental level, the organizations have done a lot but in the recent years, they have also come under criticism because uh, they are seen as being very aloof, uh, being very slow 
and they are brought down by the endless proceduralization with that, with having the lowest common denominator as the result of these procedural uh, efforts. And there is no time any longer to rely on them to achieve, for instance, climate change goals before it is too late. And, um, and um, oftentimes these, these organizations, they just don't have the capacity anymore to get in touch with, with uh, local, for instance, uh, indigenous uh, knowledges. And, um, and so a lot of the kind of um, knowledge that exists and, and the possibility of, for instance, creating these nudges here and there in the world uh, sort of go under the radar because these big giant organizations don't have the possibility to, to, um, to get in touch with them. So therefore, also many of us, us in the law are looking into new forms of organization. I mean, social movements um, like the La Villa Campesina in, in, um, that has started in Latin America. And of course, Nature 2.0 on the blockchain uh, to name but two very different types of social movements. And, um, and of course, we are also looking into, many of us are writing about how to support with regulation, the renaissance of, for instance, local cooperatives for sustainability and other shared platforms as, as legal forms that might be more susceptible and, and more easily utilized for, for and local and, and immediate efforts for sustainability. So we have very versatile institutions in maybe a little bit unorthodox usage of the word. And, and one of those things that we have talked about recently quite a lot is a movement called Extinction Rebellion. And, and civil disobedience is a hot topic. Uh, when I was young, towards the end of the 18th century, uh, I participated in the meetings of IVR, International Vereinigung für Rechtsphilosophie. And, and even then, one of the interesting topics was the relationship between law and morality. And civil disobedience is all about that relationship. What do you make of it? Of it? Well, uh... Of course, it's, it's, um, I remember that this is a, a question on which I had, uh, as a student, a major disagreement with my first law professor uh, a few decades ago, uh, when I mean, maintained, in fact, based on your work, Maya Rita, that there's no difference when you go deep enough, for instance, to the level of ethics of encounter. And when you speak about the encounter and the ethics in any encounter, it doesn't matter whether you are a lawyer or a business person or whatever by profession. So, so we had a disagreement about that. But um, it, when it comes to the extinction uh, rebellion, um, and if we look at those two things, what is extinction about and, and whether people have the right to rebellion, these are fundamental issues and questions. And, and obviously I would say that they are so fundamental that there is, there is again, law and morality, morality must shake hands. Um, as a case of civil disobedience, a traffic hazard, maybe as a disturbance of the public order, it is of course a very good example of something that I would teach in my, my legal debate courses as a topic of debate. And, and the arguments would range from what is the purpose of law in society? Is it to protect the most vital interests of the future generations? And is it there to protect everyone's uh, right of have to have a voice in expressing their views on those things? Or is it there to make sure that everyone gets to work in time? Or if we condone civil disobedience, is it a slippery slope to general disregard of law that would then bring down the structures of orderly society and so on? 
And of course, in addition to these metal level debates, I would like students to, uh, to debate uh, and argue on the basis of statutes and legal policies and statistics and legal precedents and, and, and all kinds of ways of interpreting rules and, and their exceptions. Um, so I'm afraid I, I, I guess my, my answer is that civil dis, uh, disobedience is legally extremely interesting because it goes into the very uh, purpose of law, what it, what it is there to protect, why would and, and do people have the right to, to disobey when, when their essential fundamental ethical principles are at issue and I, I think that that yes they do but still there are many levels on which these debates um, should be conducted. Terribly interesting and one thing that may have been ignored in the public discussion on disobedience is something that is embedded in the definition of disobedience because it means respecting the law enormously so much so that you want to change it, make it better. And you actually take the sanctions that are caused by your disobedience, which also means respect for the law. So they, they are not different ends of the spectrum. Their relationship is very, very interesting. But now we have some time for your exchange of ideas. I'm sure there are many things that you want to ask one another, or maybe comment on something that just came up when Odi was talking. Mm, I have a question. Oh, Paula, mm, when you presented nothing in theory, philosophy, I was thinking like communications can be used also for bad purposes. Can nothing be used also for bad purposes? Well, absolutely, yeah. Yes, they can. And um, it is being used for many kinds of purposes, for example, um, in in marketing, it, I wouldn't say it is used for bad purposes in, in general, but the purpose may not be, for example, in marketing, the, the aim is to make people buy things. It's not to make people, um, to help people make good decisions for themselves, but just buy something more even regardless of whether they need it or not, for example. So yes, there's, there is a possibility for, for using it for that. Also, the audience is free to participate. What last time it happened that towards the end of our session, the chat was full of questions and we ran out of time. Not so this time. Please uh, go ahead and, and write comments and questions in the chat. We'll definitely come back to those after the break, but we still have time to discuss these issues now. Paula, what is can it that, I, yeah. Can I, um, <laughs> I just wanted to ask about, um, uh, or first say that both Elena and Paula's um, uh, presentations were very uh, interesting and and I was just wondering that that um, how does what you both said relate to to uh, slow violence you must know Rob Nixon's theory about how environmental degradation occurs as, a, as this sort of a slow almost sort of structural violence kind of thing where we don't really notice uh, the, the kind of the effects before it's too late. So, so what can be done if we, we don't know this before things are too late? How to combat slow violence, environmental degradation.
Uh, I'm not so familiar, even in a talk, thinking of this. Very good question. Thank you very much, Oti. I will think about it later. But the first idea that came to my mind relates to art. Artists uh, often see things uh, before the others. So they kind of go first and we others are following. And I think we should more respect and um, bring forward uh, artists' ideas. Sometimes they can be wrong, but they can be so right. Probably the sensitivity of these people um, is there to, to, to see early enough those movements that you were talking about. But probably has some other ideas. Yeah, it, it's not very familiar concept for me either, this slow violence, but I think that um, it might be a challenge regarding nudging because the nudging is based on what we, what we know and how well we, we, how familiar we are with the, the context and the choice architecture. So if there is some unknown elements, so it might be difficult. What's something else I'd like to bring up? Aha, we have a chat question. Absolutely wonderful. Is propaganda always bad, even if the intention is good? And what's the difference between propaganda and persuasion, such as nudging. Yeah, that's one of the fundamental problems that nudgers have. Maybe we should start with the Paula this time. Well, um, I think there is no one right question, uh, answer for, for this question about this propaganda always that. Um, I think it's it's um, depends on on whether you, for example, support this this kind of libertarian paternalism or some other other ways of thinking. Um, some might say that it, if it if it yeah. Well, how would you define propaganda if it? Um, sort of um, emphasizes perhaps um, incorrectly or, or in, a, in a bad way some things and ignores some other things. I think, in my opinion, it's, it's not very good, but this, this happens all the time in, in, in the society and even in science, how, how research results are discussed in the, in the public and, and so on. Um, the difference between propaganda and persuasion. Again, it's, yeah, well, probably what, what is the aim of, of the person who is doing the propaganda or persuasion may, may count. And for example, in nudging, it's it's um, one of the critiques regarding nudging has been that that um, who are the research to say what is good for for people. For example, when when researchers are trying to sort of nudge people to stop smoking or or drinking less alcohol or or um, for adopting some other healthy behaviors. So um, it has been suggested that this, this kind of problem could be maybe not avoided entirely, but at least diminished or, or made smaller when, when the people who are uh, the targets of nudging are being involved in in the process of creating 
such matches, and that's what we are going to do in this climate match, so that we are co-creating the nudges with the, the people who are being nudged, so that we don't do anything that is not acceptable for the people. Nudging is such a new method, method that we don't know quite where to posit it, because we have the old way of typing moral communication, coercion, uh, manipulation, indoctrination, and education. Education is fine, indoctrination not so much, manipulation and coercion are definitely wrong. But where do we put nudge? We don't uh, yet have a classification for such phenomena morally. And propaganda, uh, it has a long history behind it. And, and as we know, uh, words in language uh, have a, uh, are laden with values. We can't use the word propaganda in a positive way. Julia Räikkönen suggests that might, maybe there would be some positive purpose for propaganda. But the problem is here, propaganda is bad. So how do you combine a bad means and a good purpose? Oti, what do you think? Well, um, thank you for saying or reminding me. I just realized how much of a lawyer I, I am, despite my, my early career in philosophy, that I didn't hear it as a bad word because propaganda and persuasion, they go both under free speech, the free speech uh, promoting countries. So, so as long as it's not hate speech, it's, um, it's perfectly okay. But, but then of course, lately, even in the most ardent free speech countries like the US, there has uh, been a lot of discussion about how, whether we should take a different stand to propaganda, for instance, because as we know, fake news and all kinds of incitement and polarizing speech spreads 70% uh, more efficiently in the social media than truth. And, and this is really something that changes societies today. So, um, yes, yeah, so, so whether there should be, whether, whether we are ready to discuss monitoring of free speech in societies in order to draw lines between benevolent or ethical, ethically motivated or ethically checked persuasion and propaganda. I mean, then we would have to have something like the, the, um, the uh, press um, monitoring agency or, or, or kinds of uh, speech. Thank you. It's so good to hear that, that I'm uh, putting forth the moralistic point of view on this <laughs> whole propaganda now, and it has <laughs> other <laughs> possibilities as well. Uh, the good thing is that we already have a next question on the chat, but I'd suggest that for now, I thank you, dear panelists, for your outstanding contributions so far, but there is more. After a 10 minute break, we'll come back for discussion. Many participants in the audience have a lot to share about their own experiences of changing the world. So please feel free to write your comments in the chat. Let's meet in 10 minutes at uh, about 25 past three. Welcome back then. Thank you.